for February 2nd is called to order. This remote hearing is taking place in according to House Rule 10.01 and is being live streamed by the House Public Information Office. Uh, members, as a reminder, please uh, seek recognition from the chair. And if I do not see your hand, uh, please feel free to let Ms. Jenny Nash and Mr. Joel Lincheski know. Uh, with that, Mr. Lincheski, please take the roll call. Members, you may unmute yourself when your name is called. Representative Foley. Lee, present. Representative Foley, present. Representative Mary Murphy. Murphy, present. Representative Mary Murphy, present. Representative Dean Erdahl. Erdahl, present. Representative Dean Erdahl, present. Representative Esther Abaje. Abaje, present. Representative Esther Abaje, present. Representative Kayla Berg. Representative Kayla Berg. Representative Greg Davids. Davids, present. Representative Greg Davids, present. Representative Keith Frankie. Frankie, present. Representative Keith Frankie, present. Representative Mike Freiberg. Here. Representative Mike Freiberg, present. Representative Rick Hansen. Hansen, present. Representative Rick Hansen, present. Representative John Hewitt. Present. Representative John Hewitt, present. Representative Leon Lilly. Lilly, present. Representative Leon Lilly, present. Representative Eric Lucero. The groundhog saw his shadow. Representative Eric Lucero, really? present. Representative Rena Moran. Present. Representative Rena Moran, present. Representative Nels Pearson. Pearson, present. Representative Nels Pearson, present. Representative Donald Raleigh. Raleigh, present. Representative Donald Raleigh, present. Representative Jordan Rasmussen. Present. Representative Jordan Rasmussen, present. Representative Liz Ryer. Ryer, present. Representative Liz Ryer, present. Representative Nolan West. Here. Representative Nolan West, present. Representative Jay Zhang. Representative Jay Zhang. Jay Zhang, present. Representative Jay Zhang, present. Representative Kayla Berg. Berg, present. Representative Kayla Berg, present. Members, with the conclusion of the roll call, please mute your devices. A quorum is present. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lancheski. A quorum is present. Representative Murphy, can I get a motion to approve the minutes yes. for January 28th and 29th? Mr. Chair, I move adoption of the minutes as printed for January 28th and January 29th. Thank you, Representative Murphy. Any discussion, members? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The motion prevails that the minutes for January 28th and 29th are approved. Uh, members, today's hearings follow up on Friday's joint hearing with the Energy and Climate Finance and Policy Committee on Infrastructure Investment for a More Sustainable Climate Resilient Minnesota. Uh, today's presentation focused on how to manage the risk to infrastructure from the changes we heard about last week. And we will also get updates from two projects included in the October 2020 bonding bill that are examples of projects being built for climate resiliencies. And with that, uh, members, uh, we'll start hearing from testifier. And so for the first person, we have Assistant Commissioner Kessler. Uh, please identify yourself and begin with your presentation. Chair Lee and members, I'm Katrina Kessler, um, Assistant Commissioner for Water Policy and Agriculture at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And I'm pleased to be here today to describe our work related to managing risk in wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. Can you see my screen? Uh, we cannot see your screen, Commissioner. You cannot, okay, let's see, we'll try again. Can you see it now? We got it now, thank you, please proceed. Okay, let me make it bigger. Okay, great. Um, so I'm just gonna move that over and we'll get going here. So consideration of risk and work to mitigate risk is central to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's mission. If we are, be, if we are to be successful, we need to make data-driven data, data decisions about risks. Today, I'm gonna to provide an overview 
and examples of how analysis is core to our work and how we are intentionally bringing attention to consideration of risk stemming from climate change. I'm gonna to touch on how we are collaborating with others to understand how the state can support local partners in their work to assess and mitigate climate change risks and discuss some opportunities to accelerate this work. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is the state agency tasked with implementing the Clean Water Act. This includes permitting, the design, construction, and operation of wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. Management of risks is foundational to this work. One of the first steps in determining uh, how to design a uh, infrastructure system such as these is determination of design flow. So this is the most important critical step and select selection of the correct design flow will ensure that the infrastructure can handle peak hydraulic loads while not building such a big system that treatment units don't work or that you've needlessly spent public dollars. So we know that wastewater treatment infrastructure is not supposed to leak. It's supposed to take waste from your house through the pipes to the treatment system. However, we also know that over time, as infrastructure ages, cracks, cracks develop, foundation shifts, and water or infiltration makes its way into these pipes. And we know that infiltration is a significant challenge across the state. This is underscored by the fact that annually we have more than 200 discharges of untreated or partially treated wastewater from systems that are overwhelmed when we have too much precipitation that drives infiltration water into those pipes. We know that 75% of these instances are directly tied to wet weather events. So in consideration of inflow or infiltration and the impact of wet weather on wastewater infrastructure, we size systems in consideration of things like the average wet weather flow or the they're called the peak hourly wet flow or the wet the peak instantaneous flow so we look at data during the wettest periods to determine what size we need to make the pipes in the system and include a peaking factor so that we are um, less likely to see those events of overflow or or discharge of untreated wastewater similarly designed for Stormwater pipes, pumps, treatment systems is done in consideration of what's called a design storm event. And as highlighted on the slide here, in Minnesota, the design storm event standard is the 10 year, 25 year storm event. So something that's, or the 10 year or the 25 year storm event, something that's likely to happen on a 10 year or a 25 year frequency. And again, we're looking for a, a flow that will ensure that we can have a system that is sized properly and won't be overwhelmed by uh, intense rain events and won't needlessly invest public dollars because we want to be cost effective and, and, and provide water quality treatment in these designs. Managing climate risks start with the collection of data and this slide highlights MPCA's surface water monitoring efforts completed with partners, local partners to collect data that include climate driven factors that we consider in our work. Thanks in large part to sustained efforts over time and with the accelerated help of the Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment money, the MPCA has a robust monitoring network that helps us track trends and changes in climate in the state's surface waters over time. The blue dots on this map are points where we monitor with local partners flow and pollutant loads 25 to 35 times a year with an emphasis on wet weather events so that we can track what's happening in the systems when we're experiencing these heavy, heavy rains. So this is called the Pollutant Load non Monitoring Network and it was formally established more than a decade ago. And it actually built on a previous program that has data that goes back several decades. So it allows us to evaluate trends and impacts to surface water from changing climate over time. We're able to track the pollutant loads at the um, mouths of each of the 81 major water or 80 major watersheds in the state, as well as some sub watersheds, which helps us inform how to design um, downstream infrastructure and, and invest wisely when we're thinking about uh, uh, stream bank restoration or um, ecosystem projects as well. Our surface water monitoring data inform monitor or modeling work, planning and permitting that the MPCA does, as well as the work we do with partners. Our goal is to use our long-term data and um, 
information that's produced by others to better understand and how to communicate climate change effects of water ecosystems and the communities that depend, depend on them. For example, we are gathering data about how our warmer and wetter climate is impacting sensitive aquatic life, ice conditions, pollutant loads and flows how temperatures, changes in temperatures and precipitation patterns and pollute floating impact downstream communities. So if you are a downstream user of uh, surface water for drinking water, it's important to understand how climate change is impacting the quality and the quantity of the water that is coming to you. Another core aspect of our work are analyzing the data, is analyzing the data or modeling to simulate actions in a watershed to determine the effect of a proposed project. We use the models to identify critical restoration and protection needs. We do this in partnership with local, local government units, watershed, soil and water conservation district communities who are developing plans for their own implementation purposes. So our data show that the state is facing significant water quality challenges that are driven from runoff from areas that are mostly not subject to the Clean Water Act regulations, for example, from agricultural drainage. And as such, it's really important to understand how precipitation and runoff changes and drives um, loading across the state. This helps us focus the development of programs to incentivize changes on the landscape. It's important to understand timing, duration, intensity, and frequency. And it, this is important not only for um, non-point source pollution, but also for point source pollution, because we need to invest dollars at wastewater and stormwater systems that recognize when those systems are disproportionately impacting the receiving water. So for example, during low flow conditions, a discharge from a wastewater, a wastewater treatment plant is, is the majority of the flow in some cases. So we need to understand not only how climate changes might result in really intense higher flows and what that does to systems as well as during lower flow. This slide shows examples of how we use models to inform state and local planning and investment. The examples shown are um, Lake Superior and two watersheds around Duluth that show that climate change driven risks are higher due to projected temperatures. So in, in areas where we have cold water fish communities, they may be more vulnerable to increases in stream temperatures. And this is what modeling in this part of the state shows. At the same time, the models show that precipitation patterns are likely to change over the next 30 years, we're going to see less snow and more rain. And that means that we'll have less snow melt off and perhaps then less infiltration over time into the groundwater and more of this flush that comes through when it's very intensely raining. And that could mean that we would have lower, low, lower flows that are fed by base flow and groundwater but really high flows during certain times. So that's very hard, not only on our, our um, built infrastructure, such as stormwater, wastewater, and drinking water, but also on our natural, natural ecosystem services. As described earlier, we consider specific flows in our wastewater and stormwater permitting work. If our analysis and modeling show that there are risks that uh, to communities or project proposers, we communicate those risks and, and require them to modify the design to mitigate those risks. So two examples on the slide show how our own work impacts this. So we develop water quality standards, things like nutrients, total suspended solids or mercury to protect over specific flow periods. And these are implemented into permits to make sure that when a discharge is occurring, that they are protecting during that period. So for example, our eutrophication or, or phosphorus standards are designed and implemented to permits to protect during critical low flow when aquatic life are particularly susceptible to impacts from wastewater. And we consider uh, and, and limit those nutrient discharges from wastewaters to protect during those times. And the other example here on the slide is related to the new general feedlot permit that took effect just yesterday. And it includes new conditions based on research that's come out of the University of Minnesota Extension Service that show that because of the changing climate, there's a higher potential for nutrient loss or nutrient leaching to the soil and nearby waters. And it requires a, a, a longer period of time when you cannot apply manure to fields. And when manure is being applied, it requires 
more months that cover crops be established to minimize impacts from um, the, the changing climate conditions. Coming back to our mission of protecting human health and the environment, we um, are producing robust data and models, and but these are only worthwhile if we are able to use them in a way that makes a difference. Collaboration is key, especially with our local government partners where the impacts and costs of climate change on infrastructure and natural systems are most acutely felt. So the MPCA is committed through its regulatory and non-regulatory work to collaborate and collect evaluate data and work with partners through our regulatory and non-regulatory programs to make sure that we are in maximizing the public investment. We have some experience in helping communities assess risk and developing plans. This slide shows over time how we've used some of our environmental assistance grants to help local partners develop and assess their own risks. And I'll just highlight that in 2019, where we had $250,000 to give out, we we had 32 applicants that asked for more than $1.32 million in, in grants to do their own assessments and to to start to develop their plans and conversations that we're having with local partners, we understand that there is a huge demand for this. And so as I conclude here, I just wanna say that informed by our ongoing conversations with tribes and local government units across the state, we understand that there is a need for additional resources for planning and vulnerability. And to that end, we have, high, we have asked as part of the governor's budget for $2.9 million to establish what would be called a resiliency fund. And this would be uh, allow the agency to work with local partners to give grants to do those assessments and that planning such that when bonding dollars would become available, such as the bonding dollars that the MPCA asked for in the last go round um, for the resilience grants to communities. Um, unfortunately, that didn't make it through, but we would be happy to ask for something like that again to complement the adaptation fund that, um, that we are prepared across the state. We need to do the planning and we need to do the implementation. And the last thing I'll just note on the slide is just a heads up that the Environmental Quality Board, which is uh, headed by Commissioner Bishop from the MPCA is planning public input process about how to recognize the climate change uh, driven risks in the state's environmental review work. And so that is forthcoming and, um, and that, uh, Mr. Chair concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Commissioner and members. We will take up the uh, questions at the okay. end of the uh, testimony so that all of our presenters have the time to present. And so next up we have Ms. Abby Finnis from the Great Plains Institute. Please state your name for the record and begin. Great, uh, good morning. My name is Abby Finnis and I'm a senior energy planner with the Great Plains Institute. Thank you, Chair Lee and members for inviting me to present today on climate resilience. So the Great Plains Institute is a energy nonprofit in Minneapolis, and we work to transform the energy system to benefit the economy and the environment. I am on our communities team and lead up our technical assistance to local governments on energy and climate planning. So today I'm gonna, uh, provide a little bit of background on what's going on with local governments and their growing concerns about resilience. Talk a little bit about vulnerability assessments that we do with some local governments and then highlight two cities of St. Paul and Northfield and their, their climate action and resilience planning. So the Minnesota Green Step Cities program is a sustainability program that includes 135 cities and five tribal communities. Last year, it hit its 10 year mark um, and we celebrated with a little bit of cake and then also invited uh, participants in uh, statewide listening sessions where we heard from them what their current challenges are, as well as what they expect to be um, their major challenges over the next 10 years. And listed here are the, the challenges that emerged from those conversations. And I just wanna point out infrastructure and water uh, really rose to the top of what cities are identifying as their major concerns. Um, infrastructure in terms of aging, uh, infrastructure that either needs to be repaired or replaced, um, and then water both in terms of quality and concerns about increased stormwater and how to manage that. And here's just um, an illustration that, that highlights some of the, the concerns around infrastructure. This is from the Minnesota State Auditor's Office, the Infrastructure Stress Transparency Tool, and it's looking at the age of the collection sewer systems 
across the state and it has some resources on water distribution, wastewater treatment plants, um, et cetera. And you can just see the distribution of um, some aging infrastructure in the state and why these cities are concerned about the cost that it's going to take um, to make these, these transformations to newer systems. Um, but it can also be seen as an opportunity for the state to really think about uh, how resilience can be incorporated into um, these systems as they are repaired and replaced. When we do vulnerability assessments with cities, what we're really doing is looking at what the anticipated climate hazards are for the state of Minnesota and the impact that they're gonna have on population, on natural infrastructure and on the built infrastructure. And for populations, we look at uh, demographic information, oftentimes that comes from the census or uh, various state resources that has information on various populations in certain localities. Um, natural infrastructure can include trees, native plants, water ecosystems. And natural infrastructure is interesting because it's both susceptible to climate hazards and can be a real part of, of the solution, both in terms of mitigating impacts as well as mitigating um, some of the carbon emissions by, by serving as sinks. And then the built infrastructure, of course, is the, the roads, the bridges, um, the pipes that, that help our communities and our state uh, function. So a couple of quick examples. I'll start with Northfield. Um, Northfield completed its climate action plan that included resilience about a year ago, a little over a year ago. Um, and the two primary concerns that really rose uh, for the, the community were around flooding concerns as well as the impact that emerald ash borer is having on its tree canopy. So you can see here just some quick highlights of uh, some flooding that's occurred in the last 10 years in the community. The Cannon River has seen major flooding uh, in both 2010 as well as in 2016. And the picture on the right there from Carleton College is downtown Northfield with the, the high waters of, of the Cannon River coming through the community. Um, and so that's causing increased costs in, in damage and, and repairing and uh, building resilience to those types of floods. And then in 2012 and 2013, the area received um, large amounts of rainwater in short periods of time that caused flash flooding. And in these time period or in these examples, there's five and a half inches of flooding and, and four inches plus of flooding uh, in Northfield, but in some of the surrounding areas, it was eight to 10 inches in those areas. And so it's a, it's a real concern that's been growing in particular, I think over the last decade around um, stormwater. So some of the strategies that Northfield includes in its plan is to think about how to include resilience into its, its capital infrastructure planning. And so how do you think about what the stormwater projections are? What is the capacity of our stormwater systems? And really putting that up front as you're planning for the, the budget for and the projects for um, the city, uh, adding smart sewer systems to monitor the flow, and then really thinking about opportunities to supplement with green infrastructure. So you can see the map on the right is the current wetlands within the community. And uh, like much of Minnesota, you know, 60 to 90 percent of, of our wetlands have been lost in areas. And so we don't really have that natural um, stormwater system in place like we 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 have in the past, as well as this is an urban area with development. And so that's going to have impact increasing stormwater. And so how can we kind of integrate those different systems of both having the capacity of our built infrastructure um, so that it's ready for these, these bigger impact storms, as well as reducing the impact of those storms by having better infiltration systems through natural uh, green infrastructure systems. And Northfield is already doing that um, by increasing the, the number of stormwater ponds that allow for uh, capture and, and infiltration uh, in some places, as well as incentivizing rain gardens on private property and trying to make that more a part of the community. Um, and then the other piece for the Emerald Ash Borer, which I'll get to a bit more with St. Paul, is really increasing the biodiversity of the tree canopy as, as they replace those trees. Um, so the city is really looking at both increasing their tree canopy as well as um, thinking about a replacement situation for those, those ash trees that's more resilient to um, pests and disease. 
So the St. Paul Climate Action and Resilience Plan included a vulnerability assessment conducted by the St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health um, Department. And this assessment looked at various impacts on uh, people's health in the community. And so you can see the map on the left is looking at air quality. And you can see that the higher risk areas, the oranger areas are those that are in closer proximity in most cases to the freeways that are running through the community. It's I-94 going east to west and then 35 going north to south. Um, and I think there were conversations last week on the impact of those freeways and those communities and not only kind of the, the legacy of disrupting those neighborhoods and displacing people who live there, but also the, the long-term effects that it's had on health in terms of being those, those poor air quality areas of the community. And then you can just see those statistics on the right there from the state of Minnesota of um, cases of asthma within our state and that um, we're seeing a, a higher prevalence in the Twin Cities area in large part due to uh, proximity of, of high concentration of, of combustion vehicles. Um, and so here is looking at a similar map and on the left here is um, the heat. And we heard last week that urban areas can be uh, 10 degrees warmer or hotter in the summertime than um, surrounding suburban or rural areas due to the increase of mostly asphalt and, and, and concrete within our communities and that absorb the heat during the day and slowly release it at night. And so without that vegetation, um, we're getting to see hotter areas within the communities. They follow along a lot of the same paths that you saw in the air quality as well. And then the map on the right shows you the tree canopy coverage for the community and those whiter areas with fewer trees um, also align with, with the areas that are hotter on the heat map there. And here's a composite. So looking at, at those um, different impacts all together, again, that, that oranger, uh, the oranger areas on the map are gonna be the higher risk um, areas in the community. And that's really uh, a key indicator to let the city know, you know, where those capital investments, whether it's the built infrastructure or the natural infrastructure can be made to try to ease some of those burdens that they're having on the communities. Um, and just to, you know, throw in another wild card, um, Emerald Ash Borer is having an impact um, like it was in Northfield and like, like it is across the state in St. Paul as well. And you can see where those red areas are in the map on the right is where um, the city's emerald ash borer trees are. And in many cases, it's likely to exacerbate what's already going on uh, in the community in terms of heat and air quality. So those are all considerations to keep in mind as the city uh, moves to become more resilient uh, and, and decrease the vulnerability of its population. Here are some considerations that the city has included as part of the strategies in its climate action resilience plan, thinking about environmental justice. So thinking about those past harms of the interstates moving through and displacing people um, and, and polluting those, those neighborhoods. Um, the inequities of the tree canopy coverage also follow along those similar lines. And again, I think it was pointed out last week too that these often fall within the same lines of uh, redlining districts. And then also thinking about integrating that cultural and histo historical knowledge of the community, um, in particular, uh, the Native American community and thinking about uh, cultural um, practices and, and histories that are there. And so they're thinking about that as they do some redesign along the Mississippi River. Um, the impact on health and wellness, it's important to consider when making capital investments, what are we, what, what is the demand that we're driving? Um, is it to have more vehicles on the road? Well, then we can consider um, those extractions that go into vehicles, whether it's uh, natural gas and oil or the lithium and cobalt that go into electric vehicles. So are there different alternatives? Can we find a balance? Um, and thinking about what we want to induce in our communities and think about what are some opportunities for some safer alternatives that also have healthier impacts on our community. And so that kind of leads us to that relationship between built and natural infrastructure for the community and thinking about how they can be better integrated to um, have that impact both at, at the location point of use as well as those upstream um, health and, and um, 
human impacts. So shared stacked green infrastructure is one example that St. Paul is really pursuing. Um, and that just really has those stormwater and built infrastructure and all of that kind of combined and then also creates some natural amenities. So an example might be um, at the CHS field, uh, they have they capture the stormwater on site. Uh, you can see lovely rain gardens around and then they reuse that stormwater for, for the toilets in the facility. Um, so it really leads to cost, cost savings from decreased maintenance of the, of the built infrastructure. Um, and then has the co-benefits of providing shade, um, increasing the longevity of the built infrastructure, better mental health for people who use areas, and then um, a, additional kind of monetary economic value as well. And with that, I will conclude on the city resilience piece. Thank you, Ms. Finnis. <clears throat> Next up, we have uh, Mr. Kevin Reed and Ms. Jennifer Davis from the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, Homeland and Security uh, Emergency Management. Please introduce yourself for the record and please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, representatives. I'm Kevin Reed. I'm the Deputy Director for the Department of Public Safety's Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. <clears throat> Once again, thank you for allowing us to talk a little bit about uh, a little different. We talk about it from the disaster side and what the importance of pre-disaster and post-disaster uh, mitigation effects are. Next slide. <clears throat> so if we look at Minnesota as it look, pertains to federal disasters um, throughout since 1953, you can see it's, a, it's been an event in every county and every tribal land within the state of Minnesota. And while most national, natural hazards can be mitigated to some degree, more successful than others. Uh, we have been very success, uh, susceptible to many different disasters throughout the years, but flooding seems to be the number one major national disaster that we have. Minnesota is also impacted by climate change and climate patterns, and we're seeing more extreme precipitation events since 2020 Minnesota has seen a significant uptick in devastating large rainstorms like you just heard in our previous presenter, multiple rainstorms of multiple inches in one location. And we actually we're ranking some of those rainstorms in the top 98%. So those 100 year floods are happening uh, more frequently. So if we use the climate projections from the Department of Natural Resources, we see that this is going to continue into the future. And because we know flooding will occur more frequently, it's going to tap into more local, state, and federal resources to try to, to mitigate some of those post-disaster. And we use the formula from the federal government that says $1, $1 in mitigation spent will save you $6 in disaster recovery costs. So that's, about, that's the number that we continue to look at. Next slide, please. So when we look at funding to date, and I wanted to give out some numbers as to where we sit, we successfully administer the, home, the hazard mitigation funds to assist the local governments in trying to implement some mitigation programs that include planning, property acquisition, electrical utility systems, infrastructure retrofit, wildlife sprinkling, defensible space when it comes to wild, urban, wildlife and urban interface, uh, wildfire resistant construction materials, and then uh, the, the tornado safe rooms. So disaster specific events associated with disaster response and recovery result in the prioritization of specific mitigation measures and disaster recovery in Minnesota. So we are trying to <clears throat> focus our recovery efforts on what we see uh, in the disaster response world. And if you look at the chart here on the left, um, 5% initiative is things like warning signs, uh, warning uh, sirens, um, generators, and those types of things, uh, lit river gauges and, and that types of stuff. Acquisition is obviously our largest um, bulk of that, and that is to, to try to mitigate re reoccurring or um, 
costs that keep happening so we can move houses out of the floodplains. Floodplains, we work with DNR to make sure that we can uh, deal with that. Some of the advanced assistance is getting FEMA and some other federal agencies in to help in planning for local communities, looking at those 100-year floods, 250-year floods, and things like that. And then some planning resources. And, and actually, tornado safe rooms has become a very large uh, funding priority for us as we uh, move some other significant uh, events in <clears throat> Minnesota. Ice has become another big uh, change with climate adaptation as we see more ice events, less really snow events towards the southern tier uh, counties in Minnesota. So when we talk about retrofit for electric power companies burying or stabilizing those power lines so that we can ensure that our communities have the infrastructure that they need during a disaster. Next slide, please. What that does is it rolls it all up into our all hazard uh, mitigation plan. And what we do is we work with state, all state agencies. We also have, this is a required, if for us to receive any disaster, post-disaster money from federal government, we must have a, a mitigation plan. We then require the 87 counties to also have their own mitigation plan. We roll it up into a state mitigation plan and start to develop the priorities for how we do that. It is updated every five years. The last approved federal uh, mitigation plan was 2019. It is due again in March of 2024, which means we're already working on some of the changes. If we look at from the last disaster um, mitigation plan till now, we have added the tornado safe room as a, as a discussion. We've added uh, more overland flooding as part of the discussion and the uh, elect electric co-op retrofit as something that wasn't in the previous as a priority in the previous plan, but as we move forward and started looking at climate climate adaptation, um, we added those in. And this is used sort of as a resource for our locals to try to help prioritize what their challenges uh, can and cannot be. So looking at some of the goals, next slide please, of what we're trying to do, you can go ahead and click through all of those and we'll just put those up. So our objectives in this is to increase the, prioritize the funding and mitigation dollars that we can pass through to the to the local units of government and really looking at what is the vulnerability of their infrastructure and how do we identify what their their infrastructure is and then how to develop a plan to uh, stabilize that or even try to mitigate some of those challenges for them and that may be uh, levies that could be uh, properties within a floodplain that could be co-ops that could be generators that could be a, a number of different things. And then we coordinate with other state agencies and the capabilities to look at that. We also are working with the, the climate group to talk about data. What state owned facilities do we have to look at and what are the challenges there? So how do we look at uh, DNR buildings or state owned buildings and what we can do to mitigate or uh, help in those processes? And then what is the vulnerability assessment of all those state uh, operated facilities and we're, we're currently working through that right now and I hope to have that done shortly. And then how do we work with our other state agencies to help them understand where the eligibility for federal grants to assist them in that planning uh, system. Next slide please. So when we look at this we look at it at two sides. We look at it from the state uh, owned facilities and state agencies uh, side and then we also look at it from how do we support the locals because we we as a state can't uh, know everything that the local units of government know and what we have to help them understand what their hazard mitigation risks and what their challenges are for um, the climate change or climate adaptation or weather pattern changes and as you all know that throughout the state it's different it's different from the southern southwestern corner in rock county than it is from cook county in the upper northeast it's different from houston county uh, flooding versus kitson county flooding so we have to have to work with the local government in their specific mitigation efforts and we're encouraging them to use the federal uh, expertise to come in and work through the process to identify some of their risks and uh, and bring in some subject matter experts on uh, watershed, water flow, along with state experts as well. 
And then we will also provide pr direct uh, assistance to those local units of government. We're encouraging not only the counties, but also the larger cities to have their own uh, hazard mitigations plan. It's not a require, but it is a, is a discussion as we talk to uh, local community development groups uh, to talk about how do they best use parkland and other things for uh, flood mitigation, because that is our number one um, natural hazard in Minnesota. And then how do we help them with their vulnerability tools and try to make a tool that's a little easier uh, for them to use locally. Next slide, please. So as we look at hazard and risk identification, these are the things that we look at from a Minnesota's perspective when we're starting to look at resiliency in communities. So we look at flood. Now that is not only, uh, while the Red River is one of our larger uh, challenges in flooding, we have now seen in, since 2012, 14, uh, we have overland flooding, but then you also take into effect the incidents that happen in Duluth where we have uh, tidal flooding, which is what we would call an inland hurricane, which is something we haven't seen uh, in, in a long time. So we look at flooding in three different perspectives. Wildfire, um, as we look into this season this year, as with a lower snowpack, uh, the drier conditions as the city, as the state bounces back and forth between uh, wet and dry, uh, wildfire do, does become a, a challenge and as more people ha, a, work on that, wi that wildland and urban interface, some of the challenges that we can help mitigate with that with that is uh, something we look at windstorms and ice uh, for our electrical co-ops is a big challenge for us. Tornadoes are still a challenge as we used to be in the top end of, of Tornado Alley that is actually creeping more north so we see more uh, more tornadoes earlier in the season and later in the season, we used to have a more well-defined tornado season, but that is changing. And then there's about 11 other factors where it comes into uh, looking at some potential human caused issues, uh, cyber attacks and what they would do. Uh, and so how do we mitigate some of those, those risk factors? Next slide, please. So what are we looking at? What's our goal is to reduce the deaths, injuries and property loss and economic disruption to all all areas of the state due to flooding. Uh, improve our state-owned and operated facilities and our database to try to figure out where and how we can best use those uh, asset or uh, funding for uh, de dealing with those in the floodplain issues. And then how do we find resources to get that funding through our own state resources or through federal resources? And this is a continuing as, as threats come and go, uh, we continue to look at where the best options for those to fit are. Next slide, please. The newest thing on the, uh, in the toolbox for us at Department of Public Safety, Homeland Security Emergency Management is this program that started in 2019 with the federal government, which is building resistance infrastructure and communities. And what it is, is it allows some pre-disaster funding uh, on a competitive nature. So. There'll be a notice of funding opportunity coming in October of this year, October of 2021, that's calendar year 21. And then this time next year, we will, that period will close. And then we put all those um, grants up to the federal government and they, they, they will rack and stack and figure out how much Minnesota gets and versus the rest of the country. The challenge we do see with that is the 25% cost share. Now, for some communities, 25% of $100,000 is not a big deal, but if you get to uh, greater Minnesota, that can be a challenge. So some of those projects that we see uh, challenged out in the outstate can be um, either not applied because we, have, we don't have the 25% match or we have to get very uh, creative to try to help that local community. Um, and that may be changing a culvert from a 12 inch to a 30 inch just because of continuous flood or repetitive damage. So we try to see how that works and what we can do. And then FEMA does a cost benef benefit analysis. Uh, for those, there are very specific um, eligibility requirements in there. And if you looked at, the, if you remember the first slide, we, for 2020, this current year that we're in, we have about a four million, four and a half million dollar um, application in for those, those uh, for the federal government to give us 
um, about a mil about a hundred thousand dollars for planning, and then about a little over four million for infrastructure updates. So we are using the system. This will be the first year that we try to do this for the federal government to to get this funding in, and we're out there trying to uh, recruit those repetitive damage spike sites in uh, local government to, to do that. Next slide, please. So Mr. Reed, could you uh, wrap up your presentation, yep. please? Yep, I'm good. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Reed, uh, for coming in and uh, presenting on that. Next up, we have Mark Coda. Please uh, introduce yourself and uh, begin. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Mark Calda. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs at the Insurance Federation of Minnesota. I really appreciate uh, and our organization appreciates the opportunity to present the information that you've asked us to present because we've been talking about this issue for about a decade now. And I know we distributed to the committee members a copy of a presentation that I'm not going to screen share because I'm going to go through it kind of fast, but certainly you could follow along if you want to. And we also have posted this on our website, which is insurancefederationmn.com under latest news, if folks want to go on uh, and, and check that out. But I know you asked us uh, to come and speak about uh, the climate's impact on homeowners and property insurance. Uh, we are not climate experts, so we're certainly not the folks that will tell you the why of what is happening, but we certainly, by the numbers, can tell you what is happening. And what is clearly happening is that Minnesota is seeing an increased amount of severe storm activity and it's having an impact on property and homeowners insurance. So uh, really when you back up that there was a past history of stability uh, for 50, 60 years, our property insurance system was relatively stable and it really changed in, in one year. 1998 is the key year in Minnesota. It started on March 29th with a series, uh, an outbreak of tornadoes that were pretty significant uh, including tornadoes that damaged uh, the, the cities of St. Peter and Comfrey. Um, and then we had a, another outbreak on May 15th of that year. And then the big storm was on May 30th of 1998. It was part of a greater storm called the Southern Great Lakes Duratio. And in Minnesota on that day, May 30th of 1998, it was a large hail storm that struck the metro area right at rush hour. Uh, we saw about $900 million in losses just from that one day. And altogether in 1998, when you add those three catastrophe losses, uh, we saw about $1.5 billion in private insured losses. And the reason why that's significant is because that $1.5 billion was more catastrophe losses than the previous 40 years combined. So it just shows you we had literally decades of stability where we averaged 25 or $30 million in statewide property losses due to catastrophes. And then all of a sudden in 1998, we had the three big storms and we had $1.5 billion in losses and it didn't stop there. Uh, the really alarming weather trend that we've seen is we're having more storms, there's stronger storms, they're more severe, there's larger outbreaks. So it's not just one single storm, it's an outbreak of many storms and it's really adding up the losses. Um, Late last uh, year in December, there was uh, some statistics that were put together from the National Center for Environmental Information, just looking at several metrics comparing states so we could find out which state had the most extreme weather based on temperature extremes, precipitation amounts, snowfall amounts, et cetera. And when you compile the numbers, Minnesota was the second in the country in terms of the extreme weather. We were behind only California in terms of our weather extremes. So it shows that it's something that we need to be concerned about. And then we really just will spend just a few minutes about looking at the recent catastrophe history in the last 15 years or so. I talked about the 1998 storm, but it didn't stop there. Uh, in 2007, we were the second highest catastrophe state in the country with about $750 million of losses. In 2008, we were the third highest catastrophe state in the country with $1.5 billion in losses. So there you see in 10 years from just 1998 to 2008, we already had $2 billion years when we hadn't had a billion dollar years for 40 years combined prior to that. So you could really see that the climate certainly had changed and we are starting to see uh, more severe weather. Uh, and then you look at 2010, that was actually our worst year ever. Uh, we normally average about 44 tornadoes touchdowns per year. We're 10th in the country on average. Uh, 
uh, Kevin Reed was just talking about Tornado Alley. We were always kind of at the end of Tornado Alley. Well, in 2010, we were the epicenter of Tornado Alley because in 2010, we led the nation in tornado touchdowns. We had 144 tornado touchdowns in 2010. That was more than Texas, which normally leads the nation. We even had a loss of a tornado that uh, hit one building, and that one building was a high school up in northern Minnesota. That was the largest single privately insured loss we'd ever had. It was a $60 million loss for one building. So remember, uh, going back before 1998, that would be the statewide losses for an entire year. Here we had all of that in one building in 2010, a $60 million loss. Uh, 2011 was very significant because we didn't have very many tornadoes, but we had a big one. That was the one that struck North Minneapolis, which is the most densely, uh, the most dense uh, part of the state. Uh, that uh, storm alone cost about $250 million in insured losses. And I'd preface that by saying uh, that was a year where, if you remember 2010, we were in the middle of the mortgage crisis. And so many of the properties in North Minneapolis were uh, under foreclosure and they were not insured. So that $250 million would probably be a lot more if we didn't have the mortgage meltdown that we were going through. Uh, and then I just want to talk about another storm that I personally uh, was through in 2011. Uh, on July 1st, there was a storm that didn't get a lot of attention um, because it didn't cause a lot of property loss because it was in a rural area. But I want to talk about the significance of that storm. I happened to be driving uh, on, on July 1st, 2011, west on Highway 212 towards South Dakota. And we were Minnesota was hit by one of the strongest storms we've ever been hit by. Uh, the Olivia Airport recorded a wind speed of 90 miles an hour for almost 45 minutes with that storm. And when you look at the metrics of that, that is almost the same as a Category 2 hurricane, if you were to put that on the coast. So here we were hit by a very strong storm in southwest Minnesota. Luckily, there aren't a lot of towns there. One of our member companies did say it was one of their worst days in terms of uh, catastrophe losses, but most of the towns were small and the damage was pretty limited. But that was just to give you an, an example of the intensity of these storms. We were hit by what would be on the coast a Category 2 hurricane back in 2011. Uh, 2012, Representative Murphy might remember this, the record flooding in Duluth. That was the year uh, there was about $450 million in losses, including severe damage to the Duluth Zoo that year. Uh, that was something that ne needed to be dealt with. Uh, in 2013, we had a record low number of tornadoes. So remember, we talked about extremes. We go from 2010, a record high number of, of uh, tornadoes, to 2013, a record low number of tornadoes. But that doesn't mean it was a cheap year. Uh, we had a big winter ice storm in southwest Minnesota that year. Uh, in late June, we had a large storm that caused a very large power outage. In fact, it was the most number of Minnesotans without power for the longest period of time. So that was our record power outage that we had to deal with. Not many insured losses with that, but certainly inconvenience for, for, uh, for Minnesotans. And then in August, we had another very large hailstorm that caused about $900 million in losses. And we would have been the number one catastrophe state that year, but there were several fourth quarter storms that moved us to number three, but still it's very significant. Uh, in 2015, there was a large storm in the Brainerd Lakes area in June that caused about $250 million in damages. Uh, and then in 2017, we had what was the largest storm that we had. That was on June 11th. It was a small storm. Uh, it affected Brooklyn Park, Coon Rapids, and the surrounding area. It was maybe a 30-minute storm. It was mostly hail, but that storm caused $3.2 billion in insured losses, by far the most expensive storm in Minnesota history. And when you added up all the losses in the world in 2017, that was the 10th most expensive storm in the world. So not only are these losses causing significant problems for us, but it's also adding up because it's having an impact on our homeowners insurance premiums. In fact, if you dial back to 1998, our average premium there was about $368. Today, it's almost $1,400, $1,348 uh, back in 2015, which is the most recent statistics we have. Uh, that's an increase of 366%. So if you dial back to 1998 to today, we're seeing premiums that are close to an increase of 400%. Uh, when you compare us to how we, uh, with the national homeowners insurance premium uh, back in 1998 was $455. So we were well below the national average. Now we're at 1348. The national average is a little over $1,200. We've gone ahead of what the national average is on homeowners insurance premiums. Uh, we were the 35th most expensive state in the country before all the storms started hitting in 1998. Uh, and today we are the 14th most expensive in the country. And we are just a few dollars away 
from being a top 10 state. We used to be a state where we were in the bottom third, and now we are, are a few dollars away from being a top 10 state in homeowners insurance premiums. And we are facing many kinds of weather perils, uh, as Kevin Reed pointed out just a few minutes ago. It's not just tornadoes, it's wind damage, hail, uh, it's flooding. So that would be the overland flooding from snow melt and uh, continued small amounts of rain, but also extreme downpours. The Duluth Zoo was taken out by an extreme downpour, eight or nine inches of rain in a short period of time. And that's happening all over the state uh, often. And so we have to be very concerned about that when we determine what we're gonna do with infrastructure, uh, but also uh, other perils like snow load, um, ice dams, uh, the damage from an ice dam is a covered loss in homeowners insurance. So uh, insurance won't pay to take out, take away the ice dam, but it will pay to replace the damage from the ice dam. So ice dams are set something that the insurance industry follows. And then wind-driven wildfires. Um, and then finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I just could, whenever we give this presentation, it's just important to note that for most of these perils, they're going to be covered by homeowners insurance with the exception of floods, as you might know, but it's worth just to spend 30 seconds to note that homeowners insurance, the standard policy does not cover floods that additional flood coverage has to be purchased through the federal government through the National Flood Insurance Program, which is available from FEMA. I bring it up just because, you know, we're a state where we have a lot of these perils and the water is an important part of what happens here in Minnesota. And of the roughly a million or so households that we have in Minnesota, we know that less than 10,000 uh, people actually buy the coverage. So our take up rate is very low. It's just important to, to reiterate to people that flood insurance is readily available uh, the only requirement is that your community participates in the flood insurance program and about 85% of them do. So that's a product that's readily available to consumers, but not enough of them buy it. So when we give this kind of discussion, we like to just reiterate and mention to consumers, always consider flood insurance because it's readily available, not as expensive as you think. Uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thanks a lot for uh, the opportunity to participate today. Thank you, Mr. Calder. Next up, we have Douglas Pierce from Perkins and Will. Please state your name for the record and begin. Thank you. My name is Doug Pierce. I'm a, an architect and urban planner with Perkins and Will. Um, we're the second largest uh, design firm uh, in the world. Um, and we have offices here in Minneapolis. I practice out of the Minneapolis office and I lead our firm's resilient uh, design practice. Um, I've lived in Minnesota for 25 years. I teach uh, a graduate course in resilient design at the University of Minnesota. And I chair the US Green Building Council's National Committee on Resilient Design. So I wanna address uh, this from the perspective of what a practicing architect and urban planner that does resilience on a daily basis is seeing and uh, show some examples and sort of walk through some of the topics that we're discovering. I can say that as a firm, we have committed to resilient design and we require all of our projects to conduct a cursory climate risk assessment because we think it's um, we think it's the ethical thing to do. It's also uh, an important business uh, tactic for us to take. It reduces our business risk, um, and there's uh, and it and it improves our projects uh, as a whole. So you may recognize some of the projects that I've led: uh, sustainable design and resilient design on a Great River Energy in Maple Grove, it was the first lead platinum in the world and some one of the first uh, lead platinums uh, in the cohort of lead platinums in the, when lead first came out. Um, I led the design for a very high performing building in St. Louis County, uh, the Government Service Center. If you're in greater Minnesota, you might recognize this project. I'm also working on a resilient uh, plan for the city of Cedar Falls, Iowa. Uh, and I led the sort of water and site strategy and resilient and sustainable design strategies for the Bell Museum, which just recently opened on the St. Paul campus. And I led the development of uh, 
resilient design standards that have been adopted by the U.S. Green Building Council. Uh, these are sort of the national standards that are being applied to buildings, and they can be adopted by government. They also include a underwriting standard for bonds and mortgages and a process for uh, implementing resilient design in the process of engineering projects and designing projects. At a national level, um, I led the technical development for the climate adaptation plan for Washington, DC. This was done in 2016. We earned a international award for this. We were up against uh, cities such as San Francisco, Rotterdam, and Hong Kong. Um, currently, I'm working on uh, leading the planning efforts for Miami Beach, adapting to their uh, sea level rise issues. And it, I literally spent the weekend working on this project, so I'm really deep into it. I want to pause here for just a second because I think there are some really great lessons to be learned from the coasts in terms of what we can do with infrastructure in Minnesota. Um, for example, uh, Miami Beach, I'm going to use this as a quick example. Miami Beach is on average about three or four feet above uh, sea level. Uh, Sea level rise is predicted to be six or seven feet uh, in, this, uh, in this century by the 2100. Um, so it's a really challenging sort of uh, project or issue to take on. And the, the thing that we're applying to it is incremental adaptation. We're setting up to adapt to a changing climate and the impacts in 30, 60, 90, 120 year timeline at every 30 years. We did something very similar for Climate Ready DC. Uh, they extended out about 80 years. And the idea is that you look out into the future for your infrastructure, you right size it for what's anticipated over say the next 30 years or 50 years, depending on the life cycle of the infrastructure. You build it to those projections, but you plan for it to be adapted uh, 50 years from now or 30 years from now. So you can upscale that infrastructure. Um, and examples of that would be, um, well, actually I'm working on the, a, a uh, resilience plan for Cedar Falls, Iowa. So we're adapting these concepts from the coast to uh, extreme rain and urban flash flooding. So we'll be sizing infrastructure that will fit the Cedar Falls extreme rain projections for say 30 years in the future. Uh, we'll, we'll sort of propose and sort of set up sizing for their infrastructure to, to manage that. And then we'll also provide, for example, enough land at a storm pond so that it can be upsized if there's a demand for that 30 or 50 years from now. Or if you're, doing, if you're dealing with riverine flooding, you wanna make sure that there's enough land to upsize a levee or a dike if the riverine flooding continues to get more and more extreme and river heights increase. So that idea of incremental adaptation is absolutely uh, an essential component because it allows you to manage the first cost now but not sort of close off your options in the future. Uh, this is a, a hospital complex in uh, Christus Bowen Medical Center in Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, so this project, another example of folks that are adapting uh, to extreme weather, this hospital can operate in a category four hurricane. Now, the way that starts to translate to where we're at, you're probably have either heard of or familiar with the derecho that swept across Iowa this summer. That derecho achieved wind speeds of 140 miles per hour. That is basically a category four hurricane wind speed sweeping across the plains. And that was driven by climate change. Temperatures in the atmosphere combined with cooler air drove this derecho and it caused $7.6 billion worth of damage. Now projections for tornadoes and thunderstorms are really hard to do for climate change, but the studies are indicating we should see increases in tornadoes and extreme storm events. Um, this is a medical center at Oklahoma University. They've adapted this new building to take on not necessarily direct hits from tornadoes, but to be able to take more and more extreme events, both extreme rain events and extreme wind events. 
um, so that they can weather uh, those sorts of events as they move as they move forward. Uh, this is a, a dam in Nebraska that was completely destroyed in last uh, oh, last the 2019 floods. And rain and extreme rain is absolutely one of the top issues that we're dealing with. Um, the Urban Land Institute put together a, uh, a report in 2015 identifying the cost benefit ratios for dealing with uh, extreme rain events and res resilience uh, events. You can see those numbers uh, on the screen. They're actually pretty, they're pretty intense. You know, the paybacks and the cost benefit ratios are usually in the seven to one five to one ratio. So, so it's definitely a good investment to place money into infrastructure that deals with uh, climate risk. Here's another example. Uh, these are a couple of projects. Uh, the one on the top is Kent State in Ohio. The one on the bottom left is a major building that's going up now in Minneapolis. We did studies for both of these projects. Um, there are extreme rain events around both of these. Uh, and essentially what we found, and we're using engineers looking at conventional engineering methods, we're looking at the national climate assessment, we did sort of these parallel tracking studies, and we did find that, you know, if you look at 30 years in the future, there is an increase impact and demand for extreme rain. In this case, this is for downtown Minneapolis, we went from a 7.5 inch sort of common uh, storm event uh, up to about an eight and a half or nine inch event 30 years in the future. So the idea is to plan for the future, but apply the capacity to increase that uh, infrastructure size, say 30 or 50 years in the future when you can better predict what's coming then. Uh, once again, you're not overspending now, but you're ready for what's, what's potentially coming. This is the Bell Museum. This is an example of co-benefits of infrastructure. The Bell can handle all of its stormwater on site, and it can also handle sort of a climate in, uh, increased levels of stormwater based on predicted climate change. And the pond that you see on the right both provides habitat, it provides irrigation water, and it improves the stormwater capacity of the site. So one of the lessons here is to layer together uh, infrastructure with a variety of other attributes and get those co-benefits. That's what really makes all of this uh, come together. Uh, this is in Chicago. They've got existing stormwater infrastructure that's undersized. Uh, there's a lot of flooding in basements that's happening as a result of it. What they're doing is they're layering in distributed stormwater, green stormwater attributes, that really increase the size of the stormwater system without having to tear the streets up and change the pipe sizes and a variety of things like that. So that's another fundamental strategy is to do distributed infrastructure to take the existing infrastructure that's available and increase its capacity. And that can be done incrementally as well. Um, so to kind of end on a, on a specific note, the power outages shifting from rain to power outages, you can see the increases in power outages around the country. Minnesota is one of those states that's seen that. Um, that's an opportunity. Uh, there's an opportunity with distributed infrastructure, distributed solar, et cetera, to help reduce that, particularly with all the microgrid technology that's now available. One of the things we're seeing coming out of our Cedar Falls work is that um, there is a potentially a limit to the electric grid if you try to do too much uh, concentrated production of energy and it's better to distribute that um, around and you can make things more stable as well if it's done if it's done appropriately and now i'll finish with one basic idea and that's that not only do we need to adapt to climate change we have to continue uh, reducing our carbon emissions and pulling back and slowing down uh, the impacts of climate change. It's not one or the other. Uh, as someone who designs the built environment, it's very easy for, and for those of us that do this, it's very easy for us to see that climate change and the speed of climate change could easily outstrip our capacity to adapt. 
So we have to slow it down as well. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pierce, for uh, that presentation. Uh, next up, members will be hearing from two projects that were funded in the October bill. Uh, first up, we have Mr. Jim Williams from Duluth. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your presentation. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Jim Tilby Williams, and I apologize. My uh, uh, camera appears not to be working. Uh, I serve as director of property, parks, and libraries for the city of Duluth. Uh, in which ro role I am responsible for working with our federal and state partners to anticipate climate related hazards to public infrastructure and devise and execute cost effective strategies to make that infrastructure less vulnerable to cli climate driven disasters. Uh, as you are likely familiar with, uh, in a 12 month period spanning 2017 and 18, Duluth experienced three successive declared Lake Superior storm disasters in which high lake levels and increasingly intense wave and wind events conspired to cause tens of millions of dollars of damage to shoreline infrastructure. Now there's one great benefit of experiencing numerous Lake Superior uh, storm disasters in quick succession, and I'm not being facetious, and that is the opportunity to spend time in intensive one-on-one, uh, -on -one, often in-person time, learning from the staff of the state of Minnesota Depart of Home Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management about how to think about uh, disaster vulnerability and how to devise cost-effective strategies to avoid future damage. Um, you know, we often think of uh, HSEM as HSEM's role in part as funneling uh, funds, state funds and federal funds, uh, they do that, they do that well, and it's essential. Um, but in all honesty, it is at least as impactful in the long term, uh, the way in which they funnel knowledge and skill uh, and organizational capacity. Uh, lessons learned from HSEM informed the planning and design of what will eventually be a $40 million project to reconstruct seawalls, the lake walk and shoreline infrastructure. From the furthest removed, the design of the project led by HSEM's teachings followed three simple guidelines for reading hazards to coastal infrastructure. First, when it is advisable, eliminate infrastructure without replacement. We are employing this strategy on one stretch of shoreline where we are eliminating an ill-conceived shoreline trail, restoring the shoreline to a stable natural condition and routing bike ped traffic to a pre-existing inland path. The second guideline, when it is not advisable to eliminate infrastructure altogether, seek opportunities to relocate infrastructure out of harm's way. Referred to as managed retreat, we are employing this approach along Brighton Beach, where we own all of the, there is a, uh, a great deal of inland undeveloped real estate by the city, and we're taking advantage of that to obliterate the existing road and path and rebuild them 150 feet inland, safely outside the wave impact zone. Uh, the third approach and guideline is when neither elimination nor relocation are advisable to resiliently rebuild in place. And this is the strategy that we are using necessarily at great expense with most of our downtown lake walk and seawall where the public shoreline is hemmed in by a railroad and an interstate highway that constrain our options. <clears throat> uh, these projects with $13.5 million of state bonding support um, are underway and will be completed by the close of 2022. Um, but we're not done. HSEM, again, in its role as mentor, um, helped us to secure uh, and a federal advanced assistance grant um, that we are using to assess the vulnerability of segments of shoreline that were not entirely destroyed by the recent storms, but are vulnerable to similar harms, particularly as climate drives more frequent and intense storms. And so this grant that they helped us to secure will engage uh, the community, our interagency partners, um, and a coastal engineering firm 
to devise cost-effective solutions to preempt damage from happening um, on these as yet undamaged but highly vulnerable segments of shoreline. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. Uh, that's all I had to share. Thank you, Mr. Williams, for uh, providing that update for the committee. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Susan Arntz, the city manager from the city of Mankato. Please uh, identify yourself for the record and proceed with your presentation. Uh, good morning. I'm Susan Arntz, the city manager for the city of Mankato. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk with you a little bit about a couple of key projects that Mankato has been working on uh, to specifically stabilize the riverbank along the Minnesota River. I know we provided you some information, so I'm just going to touch on some of the um, kind of the biggest project, which is our riverbank restoration. It has three uh, segments to it. And in that project, we have the first segment uh, the city completed last year, which was a $3.2 million match. The main piece of that work was doing some emergency work to protect the riverbank from the Makedo Powwow grounds in our Land of Memories Park. It's a significant piece of um, heritage here for the Dakota community and was an important piece of restoration last year. Part of that allowed us to protect uh, Well 15, which provides about 35% of the drinking water in uh, Mankato. The, um, at the time when we were doing the restoration for that uh, well, there was only about less than 15 feet between the edge of the riverbank and that well. So that emergency work was pretty critical. The next stage of this project shifts to our uh, water resource reclamation facility area along the river. Uh, that area provides wastewater and reclamation uh, services for uh, a number of six, seven different communities, Mankato, North Mankato, Eagle Lake, Madison Lake, Skyline, South Bend Township and Lake Washington Sanitization District. Uh, part of that project, this next stage, which is uh, we're doing some environmental review because we discovered with the, um, some of the earlier presenters talked about the dramatic changes in the um, water uh, conditions, especially in rivers. Uh, last year with the historic low river levels, we discovered that there was a uh, uncontrolled dumping area with material debris, asbestos, that was 80 to 100 years old. So that has kind of put a pause in our work at this current moment while we do the environmental investigation. And the last big piece of the next stage of this project is to improve the ADA access to that riverbank. The third phase of this major project that is really the result of about 15,000 square miles of watershed that, um, that we are at that kind of, if you understand how the Minnesota River goes, we're that point where it shifts and goes further north. So we have so much sedimentation that comes from upstream and it ends up resulting here in Mankato. And as a result, um, the next stage, the last phase of, phase of this project will be work on stabilizing Indian Creek and the Viking Ravines, which is on our southeast side of the community to protect and work on that sedimentation and, and restoration of those areas. We're also uh, working on developing a Greater Mankato Water Quality Mitigation Demonstration Project. This project has focus on decreasing sediment, phosphor, decreasing phosphorus and removing nitrates from the uh, wetlands in our area and works to create a um, a project where there's a point non-source point um, total phosphorus trading program for the communities in kind of this area. Uh, so those are the two big pieces. You know, we see a huge impact in our in in our stormwater system as a result of that sedimentation. The riverbank, the the there's an image in the document that we had provided that shows uh, the stages from 2009 to 2019 of uh, that um, erosion uh, along the riverbank near our well 15. And that picture is a pretty dramatic um, showing of you know, some of the flash floods that we've experienced in that river and the, and the fluctuation in those volumes. Um, I understand you've had a lot of information today and I'll stand for any questions when you're done. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Orange, for coming by to uh, testify. And so now we'll move to members question. Uh, 
right now we have four members uh, hands up and so I will afford uh, everyone two minutes, one for your question and one for your response. Uh, before I, we go to Representative Erdahl, I just wanna say uh, thank you to our, mem uh, our testifiers and really echoing uh, Mr. Pierce and your remark in saying that uh, we do need to plan for the future and that cost should not be a barrier for uh, you know, the investment that we're going to make as we uh, prepare for future events uh, such as the impact of climate uh, change. So uh, first up, Representative Erdahl. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'd like to uh, go back to the leadoff hitter in today's lineup, uh, Ms. Kessler. And just a few, uh, I have three quick questions that I think we get, get quick answers to. Uh, first of all, uh, is there any progress in the monitoring of the uh, Minnesota River in terms of uh, the river cleaning up? Um, have we had time to assess the impact of the of the buffer bill that was passed a few years ago? And uh, will the change in climate require change in the, in the flow pipes that are being used? Commissioner Kessler. Um, Chair Lee and, and Member Erdahl, um, thank you for the questions. Uh, we are continuing to monitor the Minnesota River. For those of you who have been Following this, there were some questions a couple years ago about the appropriateness of the river eutrophication standards for the Minnesota River. We collaboratively worked with the city of Mankato and their consultants, as well as other communities along the river to uh, reevaluate the science behind the phosphorus, as well as the chlorophyll A and algal response that we had adopted for the, the state by region and affirmed that it is the right number for the, the Minnesota River. That said, it is uh, the Minnesota River needs a lot of work in order to reach that number. And I think there was never any question about the fact that it was gonna take a lot of effort. Uh, as you've heard from others, there's a lot of sediment and a lot of nutrients that come along with the sediment that are a challenge in that river. And we know, uh, leading to your second question, we know that, that that challenge is exacerbated not only by climate change and increasing intense rain events, but by agricultural drainage. So we're seeing that we're seeing more intense rain events that fall on the landscape and that the drain tiles that have been installed just carry that water very efficiently, do what they're supposed to do, drain the soil such that you're getting not only the rain and the natural runoff, but the artificial pipes carrying the extra load. That does cause significant challenges, not only to water quality, but to the stream bank erosion as highlighted by um, the presenter from Mankato. And then um, I think the last question was, you know, how does that factor into the size of pipes? Well, you know, the, <laughs> The, as I noted in my presentation, the Clean Water Act exempts agricultural drainage from permitting. And so the best that we can do is to work through education, outreach, and incentive programs that, um, that raise awareness of this challenge and promote practices and provide funding to look at alternatives to traditional drainage. So that is what we're doing with our partners at the Board of Water and Soil Resources, the Department of Natural Resources, as well as the Department of Agriculture and the other Clean Water Fund um, agencies. And I, I believe that that addressed all three, but if not, please let me know and I will clarify. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Representative Ryer. Uh, thank you, Chair Lee. And thanks to all of the presenters. This has been, um, again, another very insightful and interesting session. And it, it gets me thinking about the big picture and process more than any of the specifics. And so uh, Commissioner Kessler, you had mentioned that the um, Environmental Quality Board is going to be looking at their process differently. And what I, I would love to hear from anyone is the extent to which there is a, a climate owner in the system who is responsible for looking at both the mitigation and the prevention effects of any individual project. I know that we have great people in all of the agencies who are looking at the individual permits. They're looking at each piece very carefully and, and doing great work. But where does that get um, elevated to and how are we making sure that we're asking the right questions all the way along the way? Thank you. Commissioner Kessler. 
Uh, Chair Lee and, and Representative Ryer, excellent question. And I think that the mention of the Environmental Quality Board and the, the public process that they will be embarking on is the right starting point for that. Because for those of you that follow how permitting projects work in the state, you know, they will come into a state agency depending on who is the regulatory or the the regular the the person in charge of that regulation. So that entity. So in the MPCA's case, it's wastewater, it's stormwater, as well as air emission sources. But uh, oftentimes projects, as you all know, span different media impacts. So you could have a, a facility that includes uh, air emissions, water emissions, needs stormwater permits, and draws energy and potentially could create energy. And so environmental review uh, to the best of its ability does look comprehensively at projects across the, the life of it from the design all the way through to the, the decommissioning to understand what the cumulative impacts might be. And just like the other regulations that I've mentioned, you know, they, those regulations are, are dated. I would argue that the Clean Water Act doesn't do a very good job at this point thinking about climate. It's 50 years old. So we need to uh, push where we can in the state to encourage us to think about how our regulations can consider climate, where that resides within our authority, we should be doing that. And I think the Environmental Quality Board's exercise of engaging people in that, in that work is, is where it starts at the state level. Thank you, Commissioner. Representative Abaje. Thank you, Chair Lee, um, and thank you to the testifiers. I mean, what I'm hearing today is it sounds as if there's a bunch of costs associated with not incorporating climate mitigation and climate and the effects of climate change into our infrastructure. So I think it's really important that we continue to keep doing that and, and do that at a higher level. Um, so similar to kind of uh, Representative Ryer's question, but also sort of adding a little bit more where and how should we be incorporating these environmental evaluations in these projects to make sure that we're not having to scramble sometime later when we need to do some type of environmental assessment because we've run into something that we haven't um, accounted for. Uh, Commissioner Kessler or Mr. Reed, can one of you take on that question? Sure, Chair Lee, I can start. Um, and Representative Abaje, thank you for that question. Again, I would point to the fact that as we start to talk to project proposers, even prior to them applying for permits or going initiate an environmental review, we need to have the conversations like the one we're having here about the scope of the project, what, what type of infrastructure are included, what standards are out there and whether or not there needs to be peaking factors applied on top of existing standards, whether that's federal or regional standards that look at the 25 year storm event as pointed out by one of the other testifiers, we have really solid data, but it's it's a snapshot in time. And if we don't continue to evolve and include the entire period of record and think about forecasting forward with models, we are not doing a good job designing based on the risks in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, great presentations today. It seems that hoping and wishing and uh, relying on altruism are not enough. Uh, that uh, the public is often asked to pay for the externalized costs of private profit. And so as we have uh, increasing expenses, uh, it seems that we have normalized climate change in our spending. That uh, I've been here long enough to remember when we had the special sessions and the phrase, there's nothing special about a special session. Well, now there's nothing special about climate change. We have a climate or we have a disaster fund uh, that is on autopilot to pay for the cleanup costs and those costs keep growing. When the legislature had to come into special session, we could see and we would understand the Rushford flood cost or the uh, Northfield Faribault County flood cost or the Duluth flood cost, or the ice storm, or the tornadoes. Those were debated uh, along with the expenditure. So now it's kind of hidden uh, those costs that we have to take account of. So uh, it would seem that we would need to maybe identify in our bonding bills or our capital investment bills, 
climate costs, whether they are prevention costs or whether they are mitigation costs or whether they are replacement costs. Uh, repair and mitigation maybe being the same thing. If we identify those so it's clear what the costs are, uh, maybe uh, the understanding of what the climate impacts are, are on our state would be understood more. Uh, so I think that's something we should look at as we move forward uh, in coming years. What are these real costs? They seem to be significant and growing. Thank you, Representative Hansen and members. Uh, thank you again to all of our presenters today uh, for our next meeting on Tuesday, uh, on Thursday, February 4th. We'll continue this conversation on uh, the three, uh, the B3 sustainability uh, building guidelines, which is required for all bonding projects. And then for the last 30 minutes, we'll hear uh, from the public on the uh, series of hearings that we have around uh, racial equity and around energy efficiency and uh, efficiency and climate hearings. And so members, this meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm.